Welcome. With this video, we begin Chapter 3, The Basic Topology of the Real Numbers. In other words, we're really trying to understand sets deeply. The chapter opens up with 3.1, a general discussion on the Cantor set, and it introduces some of the big ideas of the chapter. But then most of our time today will be spent on 3.2, open and closed sets. The Cantor set is a good example of a set with weird properties. Uh, to determine if S, a set S, is open and closed, we examine convergent sequences with terms taken from that set S. All right, those are the big ideas. Let's take a look. The Cantor set. So imagine this closed interval from 0 to 1, so all the real numbers from 0 to 1, including 0 and 1. And then we remove the middle third, but we leave the endpoints. So 1 third is there and 2 thirds is there. Next, I remove the middle third from those two remaining segments. And then remove the middle third from those two. And on and on and on forever and ever and ever. And if I do this forever, then the intersection of all those sets, that's the Cantor set. So every stage, C sub n, C1, C2, C3, all of those stages get intersected and the result is C, the Cantor set. Now, one question you might ask is, does anything remain at all? In fact, if you keep removing middle thirds and remove middle thirds and remove middle thirds, will you actually just remove everything? And the answer is no. At least the endpoints remain, right? Uh, like this one third, we know that one third is in this set, and if you follow it down, one third will continue to remain in the set forever and ever and ever. You know, seven ninths is in the set, and so seven ninths will remain forever and ever and ever. Um, is it countable? Is it uncountable? One thing we can say is that the Cantor set has zero length. So look at this, I remove a third, and then I remove two of the ninths. That's the ninth here and the ninth there. And then I remove four of the 127ths. One, two, three, four. And I keep removing and removing and removing, and it turns out the total <laughs> of what I remove is one. So the, the length that I've removed has length one. And in this sense, the Cantor set has zero length. It turns out that the Cantor set is uncountable. Here's a little reason for that. Suppose I consider one particular Cantor number. Maybe it's uh, this guy right here, some number little c that's in the Cantor set. And I'm going to code where that c is, depending whether it's on the left or the right. With my first big division, I, uh, I see that the c is gonna be on the left. So maybe I'll put a zero to represent left. Then within that, is it in the left or the right? Oh, it's in the right, so I will encode right with a one. In general, if C is to the left of a break, I encode with zero, and if it's to the right of a break, I encode with one. Now, is it on the left or the right? It's on the right, so I'll encode that with another one. And at this point, maybe you actually see the, the little C that I'm pointing to is on the left side of that interval, so I'm gonna have another zero in there. And I drill down, and I can continue doing this. One, one, zero. 0, 0, 0, I don't know, 1, 0, 1, you know, forever and ever and ever, because that's how the Cantor set works. It just goes on forever and ever and ever, and never stops. Well, in fact, if I put a decimal point right in front there, this is a binary 2 representation of some real number. And so I have this real number that corresponds to the, uh, the Cantor number C. So C corresponds with that real number, and the idea is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between elements in the Cantor set and numbers in the closed set from 0 to 1 expressed in binary. This one-to-one -one correspondence between an uncountable set and the Cantor set. So that's kind of cool. Here's another crazy thing about the Cantor set uh, regarding dimension. If you magnify the Cantor set by 3, it doubles the size of the set. That's weird, right? Why should it be that magnifying by 3 doubles the size? Well, here's the idea. Instead of starting with 0 to 1, what if I start with 0 to 3, and I build my Cantor set off of 0 to 3? Well, what I've just done is ended up making two Cantor sets. Now, mathematicians have a way of uh, assessing this dimension. It's natural log of 2 divided by natural log of 3, which is 0.613 or so, and that's a fractional dimension. In fact, this is the where the word fractal comes from. The Cantor set was one of the earliest fractals that was studied. And sets like these that have fractional dimension, that's what uh, introduced the word fractal.
So in conclusion, the Cantor set is weird. <laughs> there, there are a lot of weird things that can go on with sets of real numbers, and in this chapter, we explore a few of those ideas. All right, let's jump into the chapter proper with section 3.2, open sets and closed sets. So we'll start with open sets. So recall, this notation, v sub epsilon of a, that is the epsilon neighborhood about a with epsilon uh, greater than zero. So I imagine there's a number line, there's a on the number line, I go epsilon to the left, epsilon to the right. I don't include those endpoints, but I make the interval that contains everything within epsilon of a. That is the epsilon neighborhood of a. Here's our definition. How do I know if a set is open? A set O, contained in the real numbers, is open if, for all points A in O, there exists some epsilon greater than zero, such that the epsilon neighborhood about A is entirely contained in O. So, for example, here are some open sets. Uh, the interval from 3 to 5 that does not contain the endpoints. The infinite interval that starts at 4 and goes to infinity, but that does not contain 4. Or the open interval from 3 to 5, union the open interval from 8 to 9, or the entire set of all real numbers, and even the empty set. That's an open set. For example, this first one here, this uh, interval from 3 to 5 that does not include the endpoints. 3, 5, I don't include the endpoints. And maybe you have a sense that any number that I pick in this set, right, I'll pick some number here, maybe that's, I don't know, 4.57, right, that number, I can make epsilon neighborhoods about that, and as my epsilon neighborhoods get smaller and smaller and smaller, at some point, I can make epsilon small enough so that the epsilon neighborhood is entirely contained within the interval from 3 to 5. So look back at the definition, my set is open. If for all points A, there's some epsilon small enough so that the epsilon neighborhood about A is entirely contained in that open set. Now how about this? Why is uh, the interval from four to five that does include five, why is that not open? Well, let's see here. Here's four, there's five, and I don't include 4, but I do include 5. 5 is in the set, so I can draw my point right at 5. 5 is like the, the uh, little a in the definition. And I start making epsilon neighborhoods about 5. And I get smaller, and I get smaller, and I get smaller. But you can see that no matter how small I may my, make my epsilon neighborhood about 5, it will always contain points outside of the interval. I'll never get an epsilon neighborhood entirely contained within the interval. So because of five, five is the offending point, this, uh, this interval is not open. Kind of the same idea with eight. I just have a number eight and a single point is the entire set. As I make my epsilon neighborhoods get smaller and smaller and smaller, It'll never be the case that the entire epsilon neighborhood is contained within the set eight. That's ridiculous. So the set eight, that is not open. And maybe you can convince yourself that the set of rational numbers is not open. And the Cantor set, that's a little bit of a mystery. I'll let you think about that now, and I'll give you the answer a little bit later. Spoiler, all open sets look like either the empty set or the set of all real numbers or a collection of open intervals. So really, every open set basically looks like one of these guys. Union and intersection of open sets. Theorem. The union of any collection of open sets is open. The intersection of a finite number of open sets is open. All right, let's prove these things. Number one. Let omega be the union of open sets. So omega can have infinitely many open sets. It can, ha it can even have uncountably many open sets in it. But I take my, my collection of open sets, I make the union of that, and that's omega. All right, so if I have a number, a, that's in my set omega, then a must be in some set o, where o is some particular open set. Oh, okay, well, O is open, so that means there exists an epsilon. 
so that the epsilon neighborhood about A is entirely contained in O. Ah, well, that means that that epsilon neighborhood about A is also entirely contained within omega. And so, omega is open. So there you go, that's a pretty straightforward, easy proof. How about number two? I want to prove that the intersection of a finite number of open sets is open. So here we have a finite number of open sets. And I let omega be the intersection of those n sets. All right, so I pick some a little a, and I say, okay, if a is in my omega, then you know what? There exist epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, epsilon 4, all the way up through epsilon n, where there's an epsilon neighborhood about A inside of the open set for all of those k's. So, like, let's say I have just three sets, right? If I'm taking the intersection of three open sets, and there's a point that's in that intersection, then that point is in O1, so there's some epsilon 1 that makes the neighborhood entirely contained in O1. And there's some epsilon 2 that makes the point, that makes the neighborhood about that point entirely contained in O2. And there's some epsilon 3 that makes the, uh, the epsilon neighborhood about A entirely contained in O3. Well, here's the trick. Now let epsilon be the minimum of all those particular epsilons. And so if my epsilon neighborhood has this size, well, then it must be contained in all of them. So the epsilon neighborhood about A is contained in the epsilon sub K neighborhood about A for all K. And consequently, that epsilon neighborhood about A really is contained entirely in omega. Let's talk about limit points. Here's just a quick example before I even define it. Uh, 3 and 5 are limit points of the open interval from 3 to 5. So let's just imagine I have 3 and 5, and I'm considering this uh, set here, this interval from 3 to 5 that does not include the endpoints. The idea is that I can find elements in my set, I can find elements in that interval that get arbitrarily close to 5. 5 is the limit of points within that interval. And so is 3. 3 is the limit of points within that particular interval. Here's the official definition. A point x is a limit point of a set A if every epsilon neighborhood about x intersects A at some point other than x. So let's see that with this picture up above. So how about 5? With this definition, can I convince myself that 5 is a limit point? So here's the idea. I take every epsilon neighborhood, about 5, and I ask, does that epsilon neighborhood intersect my set at some point other than this, the point itself? And so, oh yeah, so this epsilon neighborhood does intersect the, uh, the interval. And if I make it smaller, that epsilon neighborhood also intersects the interval. And if I make it smaller and smaller, and you can see no matter how small I make my epsilon neighborhoods, those epsilon neighborhoods will always contain just a little tiny bit of that interval from 3 to 5. So 5 is a limit point of the interval from 3 to 5. What are all the limit points from this interval from 3 to 5? Well, you can argue also that 3 is a limit point because if I take epsilon neighborhoods about 3 and I make them smaller and smaller and smaller, every epsilon neighborhood has just a little tiny bit of that interval in it, and that's good. But also, there are more, right? Because in fact, if I take, oops, I lost my numbers, 3 and 5, if I just take some random point in the interval, then epsilon neighborhoods about that are also entirely contained in the interval. So the limit points of the interval from 3 to 5, that's just exactly the entire set from 3 to 5, including the left and the right. So in fact, it's the closed interval from 3 to 5. Well, how about this? What are the limit points of the closed interval from 3 to 5? Are there any new ones? Are there any points outside of 3 to 5? And the answer is mm, no. It ends up being the same. It's the closed interval from 3 to 5. Is 8 a limit point of 
the open interval from 3 to 5, union 8. So maybe this is not to scale, but let's imagine that maybe that number is 8 over there. Is 8 a limit point of the union of the uh, open interval with the point? And the answer is no. Why not? Well, if I take epsilon neighborhoods around 8, I'll, I'll start making a very big one first. All right, that intersects my set a little bit. And if I make it smaller, well, that intersects it. But at some point, at some point, my epsilon neighborhood becomes so small about 8 that it stops intersecting the rest of the set. And so I can make epsilon small enough so that it does not contain any points of the set other than 8 itself. How about this? I encourage you, pause the video and think about this one for a second. What are the limit points of this set? All right, so this is the situation where I have zero and one, and one is in the, po in the set, one is in the set, and one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, and we have this infinite, infinite, infinite sequence that approaches zero from the right, but never actually touches zero. The only limit point of this whole set is in fact zero itself. Looking at the picture above, we have a similar situation where I have a sequence of points and it looks like they approach some limit. And if that's so, then where they approach, that is a limit point because my epsilon neighborhoods will always contain points from the set, even though the, even though the limit point itself isn't in the set. Isn't it? it doesn't have to be. All right, a little bit more on limit points. Here's our theorem. X is a limit point of A. X is a limit point of set A. So I imagine maybe what I've drawn up above here, that's my set A. If and only if there exists a sequence of little a's in my set A, such that the sequence of those numbers approaches X, and the terms of the sequence aren't X for all, uh, all the terms of the sequence. So I said before that this guy on the right was a, a limit point. It was 5 in the previous slide. 5 was a limit point uh, in this set. Our definition tells us that it's a limit point because no matter how small I make my epsilon neighborhoods, those epsilon neighborhoods always contain some point in my set A. But the theorem is telling us another way to think about it is 5 is a limit point because there exists a sequence of points in A where that sequence approaches five. So two different ways of thinking about limit points. Find a sequence to show that five is a limit point of the interval from three to five. All right, pause the video, take a second. Can you figure this out? All right, here's how you might do it. I think simply the, uh, the interval five minus one over n. How about that? So the first number in this sequence is four, and then after that, four and a half, and then four and two thirds, and so on and so on. All those numbers are contained in that interval from three to five, and the limit of that sequence approaches five. Let's prove the theorem. Assume that x is a limit point of a, so I'm gonna use the definition. Then, for every uh, natural number n, the epsilon neighborhood about x with epsilon being 1 over n, that intersects the set A at some point, by definition. So it turns out that if I make a sequence of those points, those sequence, that sequence of points will approach x. You know, it's a little bit like I have my A, and uh, I make an epsilon of uh, 1, and there's some point in there, and then I make an epsilon of 1 half, and there's some point in there, and then an epsilon of 1 third, and there's some point in there, and I've just ended up creating my a1, a2, a3, and that sequence of points approaches a. For the other direction, let's assume that I do have a sequence of points that are all in a, and that the sequence approaches x, and that no term of the sequence is actually equal to x. Okay, well, consider an arbitrary epsilon neighborhood of x. By definition of convergence, there is some big N so that a sub n is within epsilon of x. 
that means that my a sub n has to be <laughs> within epsilon of x. It's just basically two ways of saying exactly the same thing. And so my x must, in fact, be a limit point of set A. A point A is an isolated point of my set A if it is not a limit point of A. Here are some examples of isolated points. Right? And the idea is that these are points in my set A, and again, maybe I'll just say capital A represents all of the, uh, the, the blackened area, all of the, the points indicated on the number line here. But like this first one, why is that not a limit point? It's because I can draw an epsilon neighborhood around it that doesn't contain any other points of A. And that's sort of the idea of being isolated. I can draw an epsilon neighborhood around it that does not contain any other points of my set. In fact, as I move to the right, all of those are isolated points. I might need to zoom in a lot and magnify it up a, a lot, but uh, every point uh, on this list here is an isolated point. Um, and then on the left, there are no isolated points in that interval. So pause the video, try for a minute or two, um, identify the limit points and the isolated points in these sets here. All right, go ahead and give it a try. All right, I hope you've tried, and now I will reveal the answers. All right, there they are. I've put up the answers. Take some time, see how it compares with uh, what you expected, and then we'll move on. Let's talk about closed sets. Here are some examples of closed sets. The interval of all real numbers from 3 to 5, including 3 and 5. The interval from 4 to infinity, including 4. Just the singleton point, 8. The set of all real numbers is closed, and the empty set is also closed. A set is closed if it contains its limit points. This is the definition of a closed set. It contains its limit points. Now, a set can be neither open nor closed. So, for example, this interval here that does not contain uh, 3, but it does contain 5, that is not an open set. That is not a closed set. It is neither open nor closed. What about the Cantor set? Have you thought about this yet? <laughs> is that thing opened or closed? Hmm, we'll see. OK, here's an easy proof that this, uh, this interval from 3 to 5, including 3, including 5, is closed. So let's suppose that I have a sequence that's entirely contained in the interval from 3 to 5, including 3, including 5, and that this sequence approaches some number x. Well, then I know that each term of the sequence has to be between 3 and 5. Ah, so now I can use my order limit theorem and say the limit of that sequence has to be between 3 and 5 inclusive. Ah, so look, the limit of all those terms is also in that same set. I didn't get out of the set at all uh, to find a limit point. So my limit is contained in the set from 3 to 5. In fact, this is where the word closed comes from. A set is closed with respect to taking limits of its elements. If you form sequence of elements in that set, you can never get a limit that throws you out of that set. We hear this word closed sometimes in other contexts. For example, the set of integers is closed under addition, because if you take any two integers and you add them together, you get another integer. Adding integers can't throw you out of the set of integers. Likewise, if I have a closed set, taking limits of sequences formed by elements in that set, that limit can never throw you out of the set. Let's talk about the closure of a set. So I start off with some basic sets, like these ones shown here, and I look at its closure. Now basically, there's a couple ways of thinking about it. The closure of a set is the smallest closed set that contains the given set. Or we can also think of it as this set plus its limit points. So the closure of the open interval from 3 to 5 is the closed interval from 3 to 5. The closure of this set, all the 1 over n, is that set again, but including 0, which was that limit point. How about this? What is the closure of 
all the rationals between 0 and 1. In fact, it's every real between 0 and 1, including 0 and 1. And what is the closure of all rational numbers? Well, what are all the limit points in the rationals? In fact, it's all reals. So those are the closures. Here's our definition. Given a set A, contained in the set of real numbers, let L be the set of all the limit points of A. Then the closure of A is defined as, well, we write it with an A bar. It's A itself together with all of its limit points. So it turns out that given a set A, the closure is closed. <laughs> we, we, we should hope so, because that's the word we chose. The closure of the set is closed, and it is the smallest closed set containing A. That's often a useful way of thinking about it. It is the smallest closed set containing A. And the proof goes something like this. The closure contains all the limit points of A. Okay, that's by definition. A bar contains uh, A together with all of the limit points of A. But by introducing those limit points, we wonder, could new limit points be introduced? Could there be limit points of the limit points? And the answer is no, and this is proven in one of the exercises, that once I throw the limit points of A on top of A itself, I'm not going to get anything else. If I take the A bar and I look for all the limit points of A bar, all those limit points are contained within A bar. So A bar, the closure of A, that is closed. And A bar was formed in the smallest way possible by including just the limit points of A. So it turns out that A bar is the smallest closed set containing A. Complements of sets. So recall that this A superscript C means the complement of A. It's all the real numbers that aren't in A. One of our theorems says that if A is open, then its complement is closed. And if a set F is closed, then its complement is open. In fact, these are uh, biconditionals, if and only if. And this second part is really the contrapositive of the first. So as long as I can prove the first one, then both of these statements are true. Let's take a look here. So I need to prove uh, this first statement in both directions. So first of all, let's assume that my set O is open. Then let x be a limit point of the complement. I'm trying to show that my complement is closed. So if I want to take a limit point of the complement, then I want to show that the limit point actually lives in the complement. Okay. Well, every epsilon neighborhood of x must intersect that complement because x is a limit point of the complement. That's the definition of the limit point. Every epsilon neighborhood of x intersects the complement somewhere. So x is not in my original set O. Right? x can't be in O because if x were in O, I could find an epsilon neighborhood small enough so that x was entirely contained in O and did not intersect the complement. But I know that every epsilon neighborhood of that x intersects the complement. Uh, so x can't be in O, thus x is in O complement, thus O complement is closed. Now, I know this is kind of weird. It's, it's a very short proof, but, but it's a little bit mind-bending. Uh, I, I understand. So if you need to, pause the video and think carefully about it. Uh, but otherwise, here we go. We'll, we'll do the same thing in the other direction. Let's assume that the complement of O is closed. All right, I'm going from right to left, and I want to prove that O is open. Oh, how, would I, how will I prove that O is open? Maybe I'll find an element in there and show that there's an epsilon neighborhood entirely contained about that element that's uh, enc enclosed in O. Okay, anyway, I'm assuming that O complement is closed. Let X be an element of O. Then X is not a limit point of O complement. Why not? Well, remember, O complement is closed. O complement contains all of its limit points. And so since x is in O, x is not in O complement, so x is not a limit point of O complement. So there must exist some epsilon greater than 0 so that uh, the epsilon neighborhood about x does not intersect O complement. That's because uh, x is not a limit point in O complement. Ah, but what does that tell me? That this epsilon neighborhood must be entirely contained within O. 
That epsilon neighborhood is entirely contained within O, so O is open. And once again, I encourage you, I know this is, so it's short, but it's kind of weird. Pause the video if you need to and take some time to try to work through it. Union and intersection of closed sets. It turns out that the union of a finite number of closed sets is closed and the intersection of any collection of closed sets is closed. Now this is a little bit different from what we saw earlier with open sets. So be sure to compare and contrast the two statements. We don't actually have to make any new proof. Uh, this follows from De Morgan's laws and the complement rules for open and closed sets. Finally, we can answer our question. Is the Cantor set closed? And the answer is yes. Why? Because the Cantor set, recall, is the infinite intersection of closed sets. And so the intersection of any collection of closed sets is closed. I can see that individually, uh, each of these C0 is closed, C1 is closed, C2 is closed, C3 is closed. So on and on and on, the intersection of all of those is closed. So there, there you have it, the Cantor set is closed. And this brings us to the end of the video. We've looked at 3.1, which is just kind of an interesting look at the Cantor set and some of the weird things that can happen with sets. And then 3.2, digging deep into open sets and closed sets.